Hi, I'm Dave Miranda, General Counsel and Past President of the New York State Bar Association. Welcome to Miranda Warnings. You have the right to remain listening. We're talking about great dissents at New York's Court of Appeals. We're very pleased to have with us Professor Vin Bonventry. Welcome, Vin. Always great to be with you, David. Great to have you, the great dissenter. Uh, Professor Bonventry is the Justice Robert H. Jackson Distinguished Professor of Law at Albany Law School. He's the author of New York Court Watcher, and he is, uh, I'm going to say, a friend of Miranda Warnings. Well, thank you so much. I love Miranda Warnings. <laughs> and Miranda Warnings loves you. And Vin has just written an article that's going to appear in the New York State Bar Journal, the November issue. It is up online already, but the, the print version will be coming out shortly. Uh, matters of high principle, pleas for justice in great court of appeals dissents. And so, uh, Vin, you've written an, uh, a fascinating article about great dissents of the court of appeals starting from 1977 onward. And uh, I'd like to talk a little bit about your article, but before we do, you've also written about dissents in generally. Uh, tell us your thoughts on why dissents are so important when you're looking at uh, a judge's thinking. Well, uh, judicial scholars for quite a bit of time, at least since Herman Pritchett uh, at the University of Chicago was studying the Supreme Court um, at the time of Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Uh, he was part of the legal realism movement. And he said, you know, if you look at divided decisions, especially you focus on the dissents, they are extremely revealing. Now, why? Because the dissenter is announcing to the public, my colleagues are wrong. I've lost. I'm expending judicial capital. I'm probably hurting feelings, right? Um, I'm the loser in this case, but I'm hoping that the public, the legislature, maybe the court in the future will correct what my colleagues have done today. So when you do that, a judge is you know, going out on a limb. And so it tells us a lot. So the judge is expending all this capital, all this time, resources, this effort to disagree openly, publicly with the colleagues. So it's usually about something that the judge thinks is extremely important. So they're very revealing. And you've also written an article about uh, Justice, Supreme Court Justice Amy Coney Barrett, where you looked at her dissents in criminal matters to give a, a full perspective of what her thinking is on uh, as she came on the Supreme Court at the time. Uh, right. Well, I looked at Amy Coney Barrett, but I also have looked at other judges and justices doing the same kind of thing. And there's when you look at the dissents, again, which are very revealing, you can start connecting the dots. So in her case, it was pretty obvious that connecting the dots showed that she was very, very pro-prosecution, very, very pro-law and order, except, except when it came to gun rights. When it came to gun rights, she was on the other side and was protecting the rights of the gun owners. So that was pretty revealing. I had done the same thing many years ago about uh, Judith Kay just before she became chief judge. And you could see from her dissents uh, during the uh, uh, Cook era and then the Wackley era, the kinds of things that were very, very important to her rights of the accused, also rights of families were very, very important to her. So the dissents are very revealing. Right. So, of course, when you're writing a majority opinion, sometimes the author of the majority opinion may be making a compromise in order to get the full majority. When you're writing a dissent, of course, you don't have to compromise. You can say exactly what you're thinking. And we're going to talk about the Court of Appeals today, New York's Court of Appeals dissents there, which are obviously not always looked at as closely, for example, as the Supreme Court. You mention in your article some very important dissents in the United States Supreme Court. 
Marsh, uh, Judge Harlan's dissenting opinion in Plessy versus Ferguson, for example, that was later embraced by uh, Brown versus Board of Education. Uh, uh, Justice Brandeis's dissent against warrantless eavesdropping in Olmstead versus the United States. But we're going to talk about the Court of Appeals right. uh, and the cases in the Court of Appeals that you believe are important. And we're going to start. You've you've narrowed this to cases after or 1977 and, and forward. And, and why is that? Well, I mean, I had to, I had to limit it somehow, not only because I wanted to keep it somehow manageable for an article, but also because, you know, as long as it took me to put this thing together, if I went back to the beginning of the history of the Court of Appeals, oh, Lord, I'd still be working on it, David. Right. <laughs> and of course, 1977 is when the, the manner in which judges went on the Court of Appeals That's changed. Right. Prior to 77, it was a, an elected process right. uh, where they would run statewide. And uh, since 77, it's been an appointment system where the, uh, we have a judicial uh, nominating commission and then the governor selects from uh, one of seven. So that was, I think, as good a, a demarcation point as yeah. any. So. We're looking from 77 forward, which is still a, a, a 45 years, right, of, of decisions. Uh, so tell me, uh, let's talk a little bit about some of the, some of the great dissents that uh, you found and, and right. wrote about in, in your article. Uh, which one springs to mind to you as one of the most significant? Well, you know, with these dissenters, I mean, I consider them heroes in these cases, which the same same reason why, you know, I, you know, I just think Brandeis, Cardozo and Holmes are, are heroes. You know, they had the courage and the wisdom to stand up to the majority and say, you know, we think you're wrong. We think it, it really is unfair what you're doing. It's unwise what you're doing. And we had heroes like that at the New York Court of Appeals. Now, in terms of great dissenters, one of the judges I clerked for Matthew J. J Jason, uh, he was not reluctant to dissent at all. In fact, David, you know, one year, the United States Supreme Court took five cases from the New York Court of Appeals. And, you know, the Supreme Court hardly takes any cases. They took five from the New York Court of Appeals. My judge dissented in my judge. Judge Jason dissented in every one of them. And in every one of them, he was vindicated by the United States Supreme Court. Um, and it wasn't just because he was conservative, because one of the cases he was liberal, it had to do with New York tax law discriminating against out-of-staters. He wrote a dissent and the Supreme Court said, you're absolutely right, this is discrimination. But the one case that I focused on, and I didn't work on this, my brilliant co-clerk, John Halloran, did. Tebbit versus Virastek, 1985. Was this during the time you were there? Uh, yes, it was. But my okay. co-clerk worked on this. I didn't have anything to do with this. Um, so but, these aren't these aren't Vin Bonventry's great descent. No. <laughs> no. Right. These, these are Vin Bonventry's great selections. OK, so in Tebbit versus Virastek, uh, this woman, she's pregnant. She goes to her physician. He does an amniocentesis. And in the course of it, he kills the fetus with the syringe. All right. So it's worse than that because he continues to tell her that everything is fine until, of course, the unborn child is stillborn. Hmm. Then the Court of Appeals, the case gets to the Court of Appeals. The Court of Appeals says the doctor's not liable, no liability. The, the mother and the, and the father, the, the uh, forthcoming mother and the father, they cannot recover because, number one, the baby was born dead, so there's no recovery there. And number two, it wasn't the mother that was hurt. It was the baby that was hurt. So Judge Jason says, wait a minute. This is putting the baby and the mother in juridical limbo. You mean that this physician who negligently killed their unborn child is not responsible for anything under the law? Well, as you know, as I wrote, I mean, that was subsequently, that ruling was subsequently overruled by the Court of Appeals uh, many years later and just said that decision was just dead wrong. And so Judge Jason in that 
case, his dissent totally there vindicated. was vindicated. Completely and totally and vindicated. And the court was, at the time, it just wasn't looking at it properly. That's right, yeah. And then we have, uh, I'm going to say, a, a similar issue of unfairness where you have Chief Judge Cook in, in Fleischman versus uh, Lilly. Right, Fleischman, um, yeah. Right, where... A 1984 case in which the Court of Appeals a majority denied any kind of recovery um, to the children of uh, this woman who had been taking a DES, however you pronounce that. Uh, you've got my article. Right. She was it. taking, she was being, uh, she was taking uh, some sort of drugs. Yes, that, some medication. That, yeah. It wasn't like she was on drugs. She was taking medication as prescribed. All right. And it turns out that later on in life, the child developed some very, very serious uh, injuries. And the Court of Appeals said, well, that's too bad because the statute of limitations began to run as soon as the mother began to take the DES as prescribed by the physician. Well, Chief Judge Cook said, this is so unfair. First of all, it is our reading of the statute of limitations that is putting the date when the limitations begins to run at the very, very first time that the pregnant mother um, took the DES. Regardless we of were, whether she knew that there was absolutely, a problem. She didn't right. know. She absolutely didn't know. And Cook said it, the statute of limitations ought to run when the child knew or could reasonably have discovered. Well, he lost that one, but pretty shortly thereafter, the New York State Legislature vindicated him and changed the CPLR uh, textually so that instead of just exposure to the medication is when the injury could have been reasonably discovered, just as Cook had argued in dissent. Right, yeah, and so great, now- Really a great dissent. Now the statute of limitations currently, you would think, uh, runs from the discovery of the injury, the right? The reasonable so that, discovery. And that's, that's right. something that we've had on the books here in New York for many years. But, that's right. But at the time this decision came out, that that wasn't clear. And no, the Court of Appeals that's right. said that's right. that the statute of limitations expired. Sometimes the yeah. law is an ass. Yeah. Right? And, you know, David, it, I like the way you say the law wasn't clear because the Court of Appeals could have ruled the other way. It could have. Right. So when there's an ambiguity, what do you do? What do you do? You say there's no responsibility here or do you say, wait a minute, it's not clear. We can actually interpret the law a particular way to give recovery as would be fair in this case. But the court did the opposite. Yeah. And I think that leads to the next one that you wrote about the one of my favorites, which is uh, Chief Judge Judith Kay's dissent in Hernandez versus Robles, which uh, under New York's domestic relations law at the time, uh, restricted marriage to opposite sex couples. And uh, the Court of Appeals in its uh, analysis of Hernandez v. Robles upheld that. Um, but Judge Kay, who, who was a consensus builder on yes. the court, especially when she was chief, was a consensus builder, always tried to build consensus. In this case, she felt the need to speak out in dissent on this very significant case. Yeah, well, I think, David, you're being a little bit too kind to the majority because the uh, statute in New York did not explicitly limit marriage to a man and a woman. The majority literally interpreted the statute that way. And then in order to justify the statute, since the legislature had not written a statute that specifically says only man married to a woman, the majority of the Court of Appeals had to imagine reasons why the legislature could have wanted to limit marriage to a man and a woman. And in the majority, they came up with things like, well, you know, um, the legislature could have thought that same sex marriages were really unstable. Yeah. Like like opposite sex marriages are very stable in this country. And then they said and they could have thought that 
it would be terrible, you know, for children to be raised by a same sex married couple. Where did they come up with that one? Number one. And number two, um, we weren't even talking about children. We were talking about the marriage. But anyways, what Chief Judge K says, look, there is a fundamental right to marry. And it's not a fundamental right to marry limited to particular type of people. It's a fundamental right. And fundamental rights do not depend upon who is invoking them. So, um, and then of course, her dissenting opinion has been cited, oh, countless, countless, countless times all across the country. And of yeah. course she was totally vindicated. Yeah, and I wanna talk about that vindication, but I also, there's, there's a quote that you include here that I think is so prescient to the issues that we're seeing today and some of the language that we're seeing on our current U.S. Supreme Court. Yes. Uh, we're, we're, uh, oh, I know. Judge exactly. K writes, you know, the court concludes that same sex marriage is not deeply rooted in tradition and yeah. thus cannot implicate any fundamental liberty. And she goes on to say, but fundamental rights, once recognized, cannot be denied to particular groups on the ground that these groups have historically been denied those rights. Yeah. This this dissent could be could be applied, I think, directly to the Supreme Court's Dobbs decision of last term. Uh, I would have loved to have seen Judge Kay on our U.S. Supreme Court. Uh, yeah. That kind of thinking that you can't once you have a fundamental right, it can't be taken away. That's right. And it can't uh, depend upon who happens to be invoking it. You know, well, it's being invoked by a minority. It's being invoked by, well, in this case, especially Hernandez case, it was being invoked by individuals who have suffered savage discrimination in the history of this country. And the New York Court of Appeals majority just preserved that savage discrimination. So, uh, but as you said, she was, many people. she was in, she was vindicated, right? Because Absolutely. a few years after the New York State Legislature made it clear yep. that there was a a, a right to uh, for opposite sex uh, for same sex rather to marry, uh, and then uh, shortly the after States that, Supreme Court, the Supreme Obergefell Court case, yeah, uh, right. also found it. And I'm hoping that this language, this prescient language of Judge K, will be uh, present when the Supreme Court looks at some of these uh, issues going forward. Uh, I believe based upon the Supreme Court's, you know, last term that some some of the work that it's uh, progress it made may be vulnerable. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So you, you go on, you talk about the Central Park Five case, which many people are familiar with, but maybe you could just give us a thumbnail of what that case was about and why the dissent was so important. Sure, the Central Park um, Five case got up to the Court of Appeals in uh, 1993. And in that case, uh, a, uh, a woman was jogging through Central Park and she was assaulted, she was raped. Uh, this became um, very highly uh, publicized. Um, as you know, uh, the former President Trump actually took out a full page ad in the New York Times that the Central Park Five uh, should be executed. Well, the case gets to the New York Court of Appeals. And the issue is whether or not the interrogation of this particular member of the Central Park Five uh, Salam, whether or not his interrogation was constitutional. Well, the majority of the court, it's not as though the majority of the court was legally incorrect. What the majority of the court did, however, was rely on the factual findings and conclusions of the courts below that the interrogation satisfied all the constitutional requirements. Well, uh, Judge Vito Titone, Vito Tatone says, you know, as I read the record, I think that the factual conclusions are completely wrong. I think that what happened in this case was a matter of exploiting the youth of this individual, lying to this individual, making sure that this individual was isolated from people who came there to help him. They exploited him. They isolated him 
and they got a confession out of him that way. He says, and I don't, I'm not uh, persuaded by this confession at all. Well, as you know, years later, we find out, of course, uh, that the Central Park Five were innocent. They were innocent. They found out who really was guilty of the assault and the rape upon the Central Park jogger. And the Central Park Five are now the exonerated uh, five. And New York, they sued New York City. And New York City paid them off with $40 million. So, you know, that's a great example of Judge Tatone having the guts and the wisdom to stand up to what the public wanted. The public wanted blood. And apparently the court went along with the findings below. They didn't have to, but they did. So it's not bad law in the majority, but unlike Judge Tatone, they just accepted what the lower court did, which is what the Court of Appeals usually does and usually ought to do. So that's well, a great dissent. There was another uh, similar case, I'm going to say, yes. that, that you say Chief Judge uh, Jonathan Lippman in matter of Jimmy D, where he also felt that the confession was uh, provided based upon uh, the interrogator's trickery uh and there was a, an issue of whether the the person who was a minor who uh confessed was not fed didn't have an opportunity right. to uh speak with his with his family and so there was a similar concern that uh Jonathan right. Lippman raised in dissent in that case right the the matter of Jimmy D uh 2010 and what Jonathan Lippman was saying in that particular case in dissent was, you know, there were all kinds of promises made to this youth who was isolated and told, look, you know, um, can we talk to you, right? Meaning the police, can we talk to you without your mother being present? So the mother agrees, the mother leaves. And then what they do is they start making promises to this kid. They said, you know, if you sign this confession, we can give you help. If you sign the confession, you'll be entitled to an attorney. If you sign the confession, we can get you psychological help. Well, as Ch Chief Judge Jonathan Lippitt says in, in uh, dissent, that's totally outrageous because uh, that juvenile was entitled to counsel anyway. That juvenile was entitled to psychological help. So what they did was they basically said to him, you sign the confession, right? We'll make a deal. And then you get this kind of help. And he said, boy, that is a formula for a false confession. Yeah. So, but, you know, Chief Judge uh, Jonathan Littman, unlike uh, Chief Judge Kay, he didn't mind dissents. In fact, he encouraged his colleagues, he encouraged them to speak their mind in dissenting opinions. He thought that was good for the majority opinion. It sharpened the majority opinion. And uh, like, uh, you know, it kind of reminds me of what uh, Justice Robert Jackson said about, you know, this consensus building. He said, the problem with that, when you get these unanimous opinions, it gives this false sense, this misleading sense that everybody agreed. And as you earlier said, David, most of the time, majority opinions are, you know, they're cutting in pace. Well, to please this one, you put this in. To please this other judge, you take that out. And, you know, it, it's at least as much compromise as it is conviction. As opposed to these dissenting opinions, you're speaking for yourself and you're speaking to the future. Right. So, right. Yeah. And, of, and of course, you're the Robert Jackson Distinguished Professor of Law at Albany Law School. So I mean, what a thrill that is, really. And because and it's because you're a great dissenter yourself, uh, <laughs> I presume. And you do mention one of Jackson's you mention one of Jackson's dissents, important dissent in your and article, even though, he, even though it was on the uh, Supreme Court, uh, the, the Korematsu case. And, I, you know, terribly significant uh, dissent that was uh, later vindicated. Uh, and you so, know, there's another, there's another one I really would like to um, talk about that I mentioned in the article, and that is Kircher versus Jamestown. 
uh, by Judge Joseph Bellicosa, which is really kind of interesting because um, Judge Bellicosa would oftentimes write these fiery dissents and even his majority opinions were all oftentimes very fiery. Um, so I placed this one um, just in order in my, in my uh, article, immediately after Judge Jason's dissent in Tebbit v. Verestek. Well, Kircher versus Jamestown, this 1989 case, it involves this so-called special duty rule. And as Bella Cosa says, you know, it's one of these catechetical, I, I can't even pronounce it, <laughs> catechetical <laughs> rules, you know, that the Court of Appeals elevates it as though it's one of the 10, uh, Ten Commandments. And what the special duty rule is, um, is that an individual uh, has no entitlement to particular protection of a municipality, whether it be police, whether it be fire, whether it be health, so forth and so on, that a municipality's services to the community are are owed to the community generally. So if an individual happens to be injured, suffers some innocent harm because of the negligence or the recklessness, right, of the police, the firemen, so forth and so on, well, there's no liability. There's no recovery by the innocently injured person because the police, the firemen, so forth, they don't have any special duty to this person. In this case, oh boy, is it the grisliest. Um, this woman is kidnapped. She's shoved into the trunk of a car. She's later beaten and raped. There are some bystanders that see this. They start chasing the car in which this woman has been kidnapped and thrown into the trunk. They chase the car. They see a cop on the side of the road. They tell the cop, this is what happened. The cop said, okay, I'll take care of it. The police officer does nothing. Subsequently, they find this woman, oh Lord, you know, what this poor woman has gone through. And so she does bring cause of action, right? Against the town because the police officers right, said they were going to take care of it and they didn't do anything. The Court of Appeals says no special duty. They deny her recovery completely. And of course, Joseph Bellicosa, Joseph Bellicosa is saying, this is just insane. Could you possibly get more unfair than this? There actually was a special duty and the court could certainly find the special duty which was established by the surrogate bystanders who told the police officer who then promised to do something about it and didn't do anything. Well, the New York Court of Appeals continues to apply this special duty rule. I gather it's to protect the public fisc, but you get results as in this case, which are just terribly, terribly unfair. And and that, that, rule, that dissent has not yet been no, it hasn't. Right? In That's... fact, the New York Court of Appeals just extended the special duty rule very, very recently. Yeah. So since this is a we're talking about dissents and this podcast is about dissents today, I'm going to dissent from your article uh, that you've you left <laughs> out a great dissent from the Court oh. of Appeals. You left out a great dissent from, uh, from I left out lots of great dissents from, from this year, from this year, you left out the the if you went by length at least it is in fact the greatest dissent in court of appeals history which is the dissent by uh judge wilson in non-human rights project versus rahini oh, the elephant case otherwise known as happy the elephant judge wilson wrote an 80 page dissent in that case in which the majority held that Happy the elephant, non-human animals are not persons with a common law right to liberty that may be secured through a writ of right. habeas corpus. Right, right. And Judge Wilson wrote an 80-page dissent. Okay, and let, let me ask, well, Judge Wilson is one of those who has been dissenting quite a bit. Uh, and I do mention People versus Tiger, a wrongful conviction case in which the Court of Appeals refused to overturn 
the wrongful conviction of somebody that everybody knows was actually innocent. But in any event, in the, Ele in the Happy the Elephant case, uh, the very, very lengthy dissent uh, by Judge Rowan Wilson, uh, there is no doubt in my mind that a few generations from today, his dissent will be vindicated. And people will say, you know, elephants are highly uh, intelligent, as he points out. They are mammals like us. They share most of the same DNA that we do. And maybe the human species does have some obligation to these others who are mammals, they're animals, they're intelligent, they just don't happen to be part of our particular species. There isn't any doubt in my mind, any doubt in my mind, that my grandchildren or my great-great-grandchildren will be taking for granted the kinds of things that Rowan Wilson was saying. Well, then when that happens, I look forward to having Vin Bonventry the <laughs> third on to, to talk about how the, the this great descent was was vindicated. Vin, it's always great having you on Miranda Warnings. You know, uh, you've been uh, a great guest. We we oftentimes have on Miranda Warnings a, a little music book or movie recommendation, and you've always graced us with a song. And so, I'm hoping that you can you can grace us with a song here on Miranda Warnings. Well, you know, David, you know. Since we've been doing these roundtables with uh, the great Liz Benjamin, and you haven't been asking me to sing, which has kind of hurt my feelings. Has it really? Um, I'm sorry. I, should, just, I didn't want <laughs> you to put, ask Liz to sing. I didn't want to put Liz on the spot. So, <laughs> so maybe we could do a duet. You're, but I actually you're I the only guest something. that has sung. Yeah, you're I do have one. something, and I want to see if you can answer this question. Mm. I am talking about a legendary American singer from the last century. He only recently passed away. He was the godfather of the daughter of another legendary American singer of the last century who's still alive. Now, the daughter, that is his godchild, and the other legendary singer's daughter, she had a smash number one hit. And The Godfather, he actually covered it. Do you have any idea who I'm talking about? You've got me more confused than when I'm um, listening to you about the sense. <laughs> okay, The, the Godfather Marlon Brando. is, very, Marlon the Brando Godfather is, is the Godfather. Perry Como. Oh, Perry Como. Okay, yes. The father is Pat Boone. Wow. The daughter is Debbie Boone. What was her big hit? You light up my life. You give me hope to carry on. Come on, you remember that one? I do. Well, Perry Como covered it. And that was a Debbie Boone song. Yeah, yeah, smash it. Pretty oh, good. come on, David, you're not that young. You got to remember that <laughs> song. <laughs> I saw Perry Como perform. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Did you ever see Pat Boone? I did not see Pat Boone. Yeah, he no. was another huge star, right? Pat Boone was great. Sure. Yeah. So just this weekend, I saw The Music Man. Oh, how Broadway. was it? It was great. Yeah. Hugh Jackman and Sutton Foster. Oh, uh, uh, yeah. Good stuff. And I'm, I'm dying to see Funny Girl with uh, Leah Michelle. God, I love her. She's fantastic. My daughter saw Funny Girl with Leah Michelle, said it was great. Uh, she's she's stupendous yeah well Vin Bonventry always a pleasure thank you for serenading us as always and ah. thank you for your article about the great descents of the Court of Appeals that's going to appear in the New York State Bar Journal uh, this uh, coming out uh, this November and thank you so much for allowing me to talk about it you know this is something I really really care about these people are my heroes well, you're our hero, Vin. Oh, thank, thank you. you. <laughs> this has been Miranda Warnings, a New York State Bar Association podcast. You have the right to subscribe, rate, and review.